بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا مولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. I wanted to talk to you about a woman actually that I I'm trying my best to model my life after. To be honest, um, when I read her story some years back, I just I don't you know when you have that you know when you read something or you hear something about just like one particular person and you're just like I just want to be her, right? Like I just even if I even if I recognize that I can't be all that, right? I just like give y'all be just give me a piece of it. And this is the great Nana Asma'u. So Nana Asma'u is the daughter of Shehu Uthman Danfolio, who was a great, uh, a very great scholar, basically in the late 1700s. And long story short, he was not only, you know, he, he wasn't only a scholar, subhanAllah, when the West talk about him, uh, they say he was just, he was, the, he was like a fighter, that he was a strong fighter. But in reality, it was what, is that he, that he was the, the Khalifa basically of a very large Islamic empire that had been an Islamic empire actually at that point for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so we don't actually talk about Islamic empires inside of Africa. That's just a whole nother, you know, we just got to work on that. That's a whole nother thing. But what happened was is that at that particular time, the, the base of the Songha empire, or the caliphate, sorry, was actually closer to West Africa. But the encroachment of slavery, literally, the, be, because slavery was introduced, of course, it was coming down through North Africa into West Africa, through the coast, entire, basically entire villages, if you can imagine, like entire towns. We think about villages, we think small. But in reality, some villages are very big. They're biggest cities that we know them today. Would be completely disappeared, right? Would be completely disappeared. So if we were to look at, let's say, in one year, over the course of slavery, there's more, it's, it's recorded somewhere, uh, somewhere into the tens of millions, right? Tens of millions of people came up missing. And one particular year, basically, let's say out of Gambia, about 2 million people came up missing. Now, the entire population of Gambia is only 2.5 million people, right? So when we talk about the encroachment of slavery, what we're saying is, there are people who are stealing folks, kidnapping people in, in mass amounts and, and bringing them to the States. So at this point, there was also, I want you to, to understand what's happening. I want to give you a little bit of that historical context because as a result, it's something that the Islamic Caliphate said, we actually have to move the capital of the Caliphate because of the level of, of harm and war that we're fighting on an ongoing basis. Sometimes we think of slavery, we think, oh, they just stole people, that was it. We don't know that there were actually people who were fighting on the forefront to do their best to kind of push back against it. And so they moved the caliphate, and then there was also an internal conflict, to be honest, between, between the Muslims. And part of the internal conflict, and just, you know, we, we have to tell, our, is it okay if we tell ourselves the truth of our history? Is that okay? Okay, because that you know it's not usually my way to sugarcoat things. But so I want you to understand that the Muslims in West Africa are in a war against basically the, the Europeans from the Portuguese to the British to the basically a, because of the encroachment of slavery. And then there's a war that's happening. Um, we'll, we'll just say with some of the northern tribes, not all, but some of the North African tribes against some of the West African tribes because they were some of, we'll just say there were groups of folks that were, that were saying, well, you know, we were warring with you guys. It's okay to, say, to sell you into slavery for a number of reasons. The details of that we can talk about later if you, if you want. <laughs> but the point is, is that he moved the caliphate and there is a war on two fronts, right? Like we're trying to solve an internal conflict, right? While at the same time, we have a very large enemy from the outside. And the daughter of the, uh, basically of the Khalifa, once Shehu Uthman Damfurio, who was growing up and when she began, she was in her young 20s. Basically, she herself was also Hafid of Quran. She was considered someone who was a master of Maliki Fiqh. She was also a poet. But she decided basically the way that these men are behaving and fighting amongst themselves, I've got no time for it. 
She literally started a, a woman's movement of her own. Allahu Akbar. And this movement basically is she decided, you know what? Because in, inside of that, so you've got this political war going on. Inside of that, the Muslim community of some, not all, are debating whether or not women, because of, because of what's happening, should women go out? Maybe we should shut down the girls' schools. Of, because at that time, there, there were very large institutions where women, when girls were memorizing Quran and learning Maliki Fiqh, there was like a, a push. It, it always happens during conflict, political conflict. It becomes a question, maybe uh, we, in order to protect our women, we should keep them at home, right? That we shouldn't let them go out to the institution out of fear. Nana Asma'u, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to just elevate her rank and expand her, decided I'm not having that. So basically, she began with a group of women in her area. And she said, I, what is that feedback? Right? That far? Make it better? Okay. So basically, she started with a small group of women, and she brought these women together, and she was like, listen, this is what we got to do. There are, number one, we have to make sure that women, no matter where they are, understand their deen that they understand their personal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they don't become disconnected from the Qur'an and their spiritual tradition. We have to make sure that these women know their fiqh because this is also, we're in spiritual warfare. This is not just a political issue. We're in a matter of spiritual warfare. We have to make sure that these women, that their prayers are accepted. On top of that, subhanAllah, she said that what happens in the midst of war is that subhanAllah, the people that are most affected are women and children. So she said, we have to make sure that these women also have their own means of economic empowerment. And they have to know how to do it in a halal manner. They have to know how do they start their own businesses and have their own businesses. And they're going to do it according to fiqh. Not according to we just got to do what we got to do. But they were going to know how to do it so that those women would have tawfiq inside of their affairs. She also said, we know that subhanAllah, she said, in some of these areas that people don't have, you know, people don't actually have access to water. We have to make sure that people always have access to water. That we want to make, we have to still take care of our people because when the caliphate, when the caliphate moves, right, then basically it's like the capital is going, they, they, her fear was like now the capital is going to be that place where people, you know, the elite can also move, but everybody can't move. Everyone can't afford to move. Who's got a tissue for me? I need a tissue. Somebody have a tissue? Jazakat al khair. You know what's happening. Thank you. So she understood that everybody can't move. But also she understood that because of the encroachment of slavery, I want us to think about it for a minute. If you go into a region and you steal the most... You steal, basically, let's say, those that could be the labor and the ones who were going to be able to do the work. And we're not just talking about the farmers, right? We're also talking about the muscle. We're also talking about the stealing of the army. We're also talking about the stealing of the teachers. We're talking about the stealing of the, uh, of the builders, of the craftsmen. We're talking about those who do construction. We're talking about the doctors. We're talking about the Quran teacher. We're talking about, we're not, sometimes we think it's just one class. If we say we're going to steal, right, majority of this place, Who's going to be left? The weak, the vulnerable. Right. And so what she says is, you know, what happens in these situations is sometimes they won't have they won't have proper access to food. We've got to make sure that these populations are still taken care of. And lastly, she said, of course, in these situations, is that if you know if women are having babies. If people are getting sick because of not having clean water, they've got to have access to health care. So basically, she started with a small group of women. And to make a long story short, every time she would go into a village and she would make sure that the, that village would have those five things. She would always come and teach sacred knowledge making sure that they knew their deen properly, they knew, uh, they, they studied aqidah, 
they would study Maliki Fiqh. Uh, she would make sure then that they had some kind of economic arm by which those women would be able to sustain themselves. She would, so then she would also build a school and she would build a clinic. And she'd then train a group of women who were in that village that she would train them to the point that now I can hand over this project to you. So you don't, if, if they tell you, you can't come into the masjid, you don't have to worry about it because your job is to make sure that these women, the women in this particular area know their deen fully intact and that they are not dependent upon anyone economically because they know how to sustain themselves that they have established their own businesses. When it comes to, she looked at, okay, who are the midwives in the community? There's one, right? If we can train one of you to be the midwife, then your job is to train somebody else and to get an apprentice. So then we're taking care of our own health care. She did that in over 800 villages. I know, raise your hand if you're like, can I just have a piece of just a little bit, just a teeny bit, right? So I'm like, wait a minute. First, you didn't just train. And in every, in every village she went to, she made sure she left a group of women who were basically who were at a scholarly level that they could then train the other women, that they then became responsible. To date, we still have, the, we still have that. Definitely throughout Senegal, definitely throughout places in Nigeria and Gambia and Mauritania. You have places where women have their own centers, their own Quran memorization centers. They study Maliki Fiqh. They have their own, what they like, a, they call it, even they call it a susu in terms of the way they support each other. I tell us this to say that a lot of times as women, I give you this, this story. To, it's, it's exactly what we're talking about when we talk about having a level of faith, right? And resilience and knowing what is, you, you don't actually need to know it all. And you don't actually need the support of every man in the masjid. I, I, I know, please, maybe, you know, so y'all close the doors because I don't want nobody to get mad. But in our, you know, sometimes we're so focused on, well, the men won't let me, or, I, you know, the men are holding us back, or the blah, 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 Whatever it is, as opposed to let them run their affairs and let us run ours, right? That they are not basically look for the path of least resistance. I'm not concerned, subhanAllah, you as women, you're raising men. You're raising them. So if you want something different, then you make something different, right? You want a different reality for the next generation? You're the one responsible for that. Trust me. Trust me. So when I think about, subhanAllah, us, like even, you know, all of you are familiar with the Kubasi movement, right? Inside of Syria. Yes? No? Alhamdulillah. Right? What was it? It was a group of women who said, I don't know what these men are teaching. No, am I concerned? But I know where, subhanAllah, the, if, I, if we get to the root of all of them, if I get to the um of the ummah, if I get to the root of this force, that's where the change is going to happen. Right? That's where it's going to happen. And we, subhanAllah, in America, we've gotten it, we've gotten it so twisted that we're so, we're so busy. And it's funny because on one hand, we understand it. If I say to you the power, the, the you know, powers with the people, you understand that. But somehow <laughs> you're more concerned about the imam than the people who are following him. When the imam does not actually get any ajr unless the people, <laughs> unless he has a jamaat. And if you're contingent, you're, if you're in, in contingent, making your deen contingent upon, you're in front, something like that. Okay. You know what I'm trying to say though, right? If you're just pinning your dean on this one person, when you yourself, right, and I see it, are, we're not knowledgeable about our own dean. So if the imam makes a mistake and he, you know, he's, if he salams out in the third raka'at and you know that they're four, but you don't know what you're supposed to do, you also have a personal responsibility to know your dean. 
We have a personal, and alhamdulillah wa shukurillah, you have enough teachers inside of your, I'm, I'm actually impressed with you, to be honest. I'm very impressed with you in the Bay. Like, you, you, you can't, you guys can't cry that. We don't have female scholars. You can't cry that. You can't make that claim. You wouldn't be able to say that and be accurate. Right? Honestly, you have teachers who are, mashallah, organizing for you, calling me all the way from the Gambia, right? You have, you have women who are organizers and you're professionals, right? Some of you are entrepreneurs, have your own businesses. Some of you, I mean, mashallah, tabaraka rahman, you're probably in this room alone. We probably have about a hundred powerhouses in this room alone. But we have to act collectively. We have to be those women who are saying, I don't know what's going on out there, nor am I really concerned. Right? That I know what's happening in here. I know what I'm, 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 I, I'm concerned about making sure that we stay consistent. And yes, alhamdulillah, it cannot just be on the, you know, yes, it's on a religious standpoint, it, it's important. Alhamdulillah, I, I want to talk a little bit about the way that we are in, addressing as women. It, I hope y'all don't get mad at me. If you do, it's okay. I love you anyway. How we as women are beginning to address the, what I would say, the incumbent, I don't know. I'm, my English is lacking these days. Make dua for me. <laughs> the encroaching threat. That's what I want to say. That we have a number of threats to you, to your, to your daughters, to, the, to your most basic identity. But are we using the methods of Islam and the prophetic example and the teaching that we've been given in order to address it? And if you are waiting for men, I'm going to tell you a funny story. It's, I, w I wish it was funny, but it's not really. I was at a conference. Let's just say, in the conference, there was a moment of like difficulty. So there was a break and then it was like, okay, let's huddle up and figure out how are we going to address uh, basically the, the conflict that happened in the session. So we came to convene and as we co were convening, I wasn't in the session. I knew what the session was about. I wasn't in that session for a reason. <laughs> but when it came to convene, they said, can you please come and, uh, you know, help us figure out how we're going to go back and, and to address the problem. So I said, Bismillah. In the course of that, <clears throat> Someone who is a scholar, graduated with many degrees in Islamic studies, also has multiple degrees, let's say in a in the American uh, from an American academic standpoint, said to me, "The truth is, Sister Aisha, is that we don't have any idea what you women are talking about." He said, I'm just going to be very honest with you. I said, please be. He said, when you women talk about that you guys get broken, he's like, I don't know what that broken is. I literally was like, are you for real? He's like, I'm being honest. I don't know what you're talking about. In that moment, I said to myself, I actually then tried to explain it. And then I realized we're depending on someone.
to teach us the Islamic sciences of the heart that have no idea about, about not just the condition of your heart, but the anatomy of your heart. So we're expecting someone to do heart surgery on us that doesn't even know what is in your heart, what is your heart, how does it work? Immediately I said at that moment, I need to call all my sisters who study, who are in this work, and say, it's important that just for now, I don't mean this in a bad, I don't mean it in a bad way. It's not a, it's not a, um, a discredit to them. That's, that's not my fear. I'm not worried about that. It's not about a discredit to them. It became a serious charge for us. Sometimes we're looking at somebody else's inadequacy when in reality, you are the change that you're looking for. And so when I think about the story of Nana Asma, she, there's something that you have been gifted with as women. It's, a, it's, just a, it's like a gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just adorned you with. That other people just didn't get it. And it's, it's like the, it's literally the filament in a light bulb. That, mashallah, the casing, right? Right? It looks like it's out front. It looks like it's the light bulb. But really, it's the filament inside that makes it work. That's what you are. And so, I go back to say this. When we respond to our circumstances, our societal circumstances... In a, with a philosophy or a methodology that is not consistent with the Qur'an and the prophetic example, number one, we lose credibility. That's the first thing. We lose credibility. And number two, eventually, it's going to harm our own selves. Let me give you an example. In the feminist movement, they rah rah rahed and philosophized themselves out of their own identity. So the whole point initially was to talk about our empowerment as women and to talk about this is my place as women and to fight for the rights of women. That was the point, right? That was the point. But see, when you keep acting out of a way that's not sirat al-mustaqim, that's not a straight path. Now, you're not a woman. The one who was a woman is no longer a woman. She's a birthing person. A chest feeder. Anybody can be you. Actually, your womanhood is not that. It's a commodity. We could just change some parts. And then anybody can be you. Not only we just change your parts and anybody can be you. I could just claim it and you must call me that. And your rights that you had, that you fought for, whether it be in the sports realm or in other realms, you, sold your, you said yourself you were so equal, so same. We were the same, 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 same. Then men say, well, then we're the same. So now we compete and we're the same. So now, you're, that now, men, can, now men who claim to be women can now compete with you and then say, well, you have no problem that you should lose because I'm a woman too. So going back to what I was saying as it relates to Meaning that when we, you can, you can have actually a righteous intention. But if you don't have the correct methodology for how to address the problem, then you'll actually end up with a bigger problem than what you started with. So in our situation as Muslim women, what we did, they, they, they spoke to our pain. They spoke to certain, in, certain injustices that were happening with us. They spoke to the, to the issues of gender injustice. 
but because they used a man-made model in order to address the problem, literally in the end it becomes something that by which we're almost becoming a renegade out of our deen. So when we look at our when we look at the likes of Nana Asma, what I love about the her methodology. That's just so weird. Right? <laughs> but don't worry, we're gonna pray. Right? Right? They definitely right. Okay. So the the point is that in the case of Nana Asma, what I loved about the way that she said we need to address the problem is that the first thing is that these women have to know their dean. Right? Now at that time there wasn't a question. And I, I actually find this beautifully and uncanny that there, there's something that you don't actually, you don't have to tell a woman who's raised in tradition that, about being a woman. Like the thought that somebody else can be a woman for her, that's laughable. But the fact that we are in 2023 somehow thinking that now we are the first people to somehow come up with like this great idea. Is laughable. But we as Muslim women have actually began, right, to even start studying, taking up four or five years of study on something without first having a proper foundation in our aqidah. What if I were to ask you from an aqidah standpoint, who are you as a woman? Right? And if you tell me a mother, I'm going to shout from the top of my lungs. Because our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala an was definitely a woman and she never had children. Right? If we look at, you know, Queen Asiya, the woman who raised Musa, who's known as one of the most four perfect women. Right? She never had children. So we are, that's the, my whole point is that we are, you know, somehow even like we're invested and we're following these and we're down for this and we're following this method and blah, blah, blah. And that's the method I'm going to go. We have mistaken when we talk about re resilience and resistance, we have come to a resistance movement, misunderstanding that our resistance is a resistance to shaitan and the, and the Dajjal and his army and their thinking and their ways and their methodology. That our resistance is a submission to Allah no matter what. That's our resistance. That our resilience is to stand up for this is, you will, you will not encroach upon deen. And you as women, subhanAllah, you're, you're, you are created to be hafidhatul al ghaib. Hafidhatul al ghaib meaning that you are the preservers of the unseen. When we look, Allahu Akbar. I, I, I want you to understand this about yourself because it's so significant. What does it mean for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to name you as the hafidhatul al ghaib? The first thing is that, I'll give you an example. And our mother Khadija, Right? Or even in the in the mother of Musa. In the mother of Musa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving her ilham. He's speaking to her. Wa in Omi Musa that he's given her revelation that I'm going to inspire you and to protect something. And you're the way that you're going to protect and guard over it. You have no idea that this is this is about to be serious. Like the mother of Musa is holding a big secret that we don't talk about. The mother of Musa is told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't worry, I'm going to return him to you and I'm going to make him from amongst the messengers. Is that not revelation? But this is, this, this is the secret that she's holding. And her job is to be a guardian over that which hasn't been told yet. About that which hasn't been revealed yet. When we look at our mother Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha and the way that she loves and takes care of and supports the Prophet sallallahu that Allah put her in that position because of her qualities, because of what she brings to the table. And I'm not talking about her finances. I'm talking about her character. What is she preserving? What is she protecting? She's protecting Rahmat al Alameen. Right. We 
could go into some of there's so many uh, so many aspects of what it means but your this is why even historically women were known to be the preservers of a hadith they're known to be the preservers of the prophetic tradition that's the role we've played in society until now right that you are the preservers of prophetic tradition that the way that someone one of the key ways to know whether or not a hadith was sound was whether or not it was what there's a woman in its chain because she's never known to be a fabricator to fabricate a hadith so i just want to say that as we're talking about this you know there are a number of enemies that you've got to be resilient over and I'm sure Sheikh Samira, you've heard it in this message. What are your four enemies? Shaitan, Nafs, Shaitan, or Iblis. You know, you know Iblis comes from oh, okay, I'll tell you in a minute. Let's first get to it. So Dunya, Hubbu Dunya, love of Dunya. These are your four enemies. Iblis comes from the root word balasa, which means to be hopeless. So one of the biggest things that that house shaitan it comes to you and whispers to you is that sense of it's not going to get any better. That sense of hopelessness. They're not going to let us. You know, they're, they're, they just keep pushing me down. They're not responding. They're not listening. As opposed to, why are you even inside my framework? That's the, actually, that's the beauty of women having gendered spaces in Islam. The beauty of women having gendered spaces is for us to understand you you are a Jama'at. <laughs> you are a power. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barikna sayyidina wa habibina munana muhammadin wa anayhi sallam wa sallam. One of the biggest ways, and I, I want us to not think it's small, I just, I'm, I'm going to emphasize it in 10 different ways, is that our resilience how do you gain the confidence you've got to study the women in our in within the prophetic tradition subhanallah you guys are familiar with nusayba um amara right for me that's like the, i just love her she's like one of my you know my great loves where subhanallah she's she's in the tent of women who are helping the wounded and the men subhanallah the archers on the mound descend from their position the battle of Uhud. And she can see the warring army coming from one side and the Prophet وسلم, coming up on the other. Right? And she doesn't say, stand there, come up, these men, oh my God, they don't love their position. Let me go run around and tell these men what they need to do. No, she just ran up the mountain. Right? Stood between the soldiers and the Prophet. And she defended the Prophet and sent him and saves his life until they realized, oh my goodness, we need to go back to our position. Why did she do that? Because she's a preserver. <laughs> that who we are is that we're someone who are, are preservers of this deen. And so... We can't throw our deen behind our back thinking that we're, that Islam is that which oppressed us and I've got to run towards some kind of anything, liberation of any type that's somehow going to set me free. Trust me, that's going to leave you, shaitan is going to put you in a trap and then sit back and laugh at you. I, I definitely believe he's laughing at us in our current gender politics. You people are so confused, you don't know what you are. So it becomes uh, incumbent upon us. Number one, I've already said it. Like I said, I'm going to emphasize it in 10 different ways. We've got to come together to study our own dean and become rooted. we got to know it, like know it, like know it, like know it, like know it. And then we've got to come together and build institution together. All right. And we've got to make sure there's a, there's a care and concern that we have to have for each other on a regular basis. 
Do you need anything? He said, I know you just had a baby. Let's get this rotation going. Make sure you have food. You know, there should be definitely there should be no one in our in our community that's hungry. I don't think nobody in the Bay is hungry. I do no, a lot of people hungry in the Bay. Yeah, they feed MCC feeds four hundred people. Subhanallah. That's that's shameful, don't be honest. That's shameful. Like in a place so wealthy, like for there to be people who act that's that's shameful. That's shameful. Yeah, so we have to make, but alhamdulillah, you guys are organizing, you're feeding people, right? There are people who are involved with that. You want to be involved with that. That's one of the first commandments that the Prophet ﷺ gave when he entered into Medina. Give salam and feed people. Right? So alhamdulillah, you, you guys are doing that. But that's, I, I cannot say enough, 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 enough. Even when we're thinking about going into business, when we're thinking about organizing you you got to ask what are the rulings on how do we how do we do that how do we do it so that we can be sure we're having tawfiq wa afia that we're doing it according to the way Allah and his messenger have decreed what are the rules and regulations about that so that we can have success with dunya wa akhira testing you know testing on an individual level that part is promise Allah said he will you will did you think that you would be left alone and not be tested saying you believe and not be tested of course you will like that's a part of the, you know, that's, that's a part of the process. You squeeze a lemon, what are you going to get? Lemon juice. If you squeeze an apple, what are you going to get? Huh? Apple juice. If you squeeze a mutman, what are you going to get? Don't tell me mutman juice. <laughs> Why? You should get, if you squeeze, you should get iman. <laughs> You should get, like, you know, when it's like, it's something that it shouldn't break you. It should make you. It's like, oh, this is, this is who I'm about to become. I'm about to get to this next level. Right? I'm about to, I'm about to rise to this next level. So, it's, it's, sometimes it's our trials that determine who we'll be. But let's not look at them as something that breaks us, as opposed to the opportunity to rise up. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. I don't know what time it is. That's exactly on time. So, Jazakallah khairan. Thank you so much. Okay. Her question is like with the Kubasi women, how do we start a movement? How do we do it? So the first thing, even like Nana Asma, they started with a small group of women. And it's women who are committed. So, you know, what I noticed in these situations, like you say, okay, we're going to do a year intensive. And inside of that year intensive, we're going to study Aqidah, we're going to study Fiqh, we're going to study certain verses. Let's just say, I'm going to say some uh, highlighted verses from the Quran. Then you train those women on those particular things. And those verses are pretty much connected, of course, to their ibadah, but also connected to their circumstances. So you train those women. Now, you're going to start out with 40. In the end, you're going to have about 10. It's just the nature of it. Oh, I got this. This is why I this is what happened. But that's, that's fine. That's, I'm always like, it, does, it just takes a few to make a difference amongst many. So, subhanAllah, you, with that 10, once you train them, alhamdulillah, now they have responsibilities. Right, whether it be in a masjid or in a general community. And their job is they need to train at least five. Right? Preferably those women are also from other places. So if you did it online, right? Preferably those women are from other places. The other thing is is that so that's your women who are knowledgeable. You need to find out also who are the who are the women in business, who are the women in finance, who are the women who are the who are the, the money makers in the community. And so really those women have to also be committed. They should have some training as it relates to like these are like these are the um, so there's a really great sheikh may Allah bless him um, but I think also yakin they have some basically the rules around like nonprofit work and you know things like that that also related to business as well and you start with them a social enterprise and we say okay from these from this group and that may be larger they say okay we give this this much to get so in the susu what they do um in for example in west africa is the women say we're going to support this particular business that's run by that that'll be run even also by the community um i'll give you a perfect example you ever heard of an organization called 10,000 villages so it's a but 10,000 villages is a group of women who go to different places in the in the world 
It's a little bit. They're Christian Mennonite women. They're basically they buy different products, fair trade from different that are used. They're produced by different people. They sell them in a store in America. They bought a. They bought this for seventy five cents. They sell it for seventy five dollars. <laughs> Just being honest, <laughs> I've seen it. <laughs> right. Um, but they have a store. They use it actually to run their church. Most people don't know that they're 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 Mennonite. They're they're now also the women who work in the place are a part of that church, and they're just volunteering so many hours or whatever a week. All right, and so then it it becomes back recycled. Now I don't know if they use it for particular causes, but I say then we should use it for particular causes that are specifically related to women. So what are some of the initiatives you guys have in the community? Like that are specifically related to women. Claudia. Claudia app. Yes. What was it? Oh, yes. Right. Like the domestic violence shelter. And they always need funding. They always need help. So it's like, okay, this particular business venture that we came up with, whatever the model it is that we're selling, that the proceeds from it, at least, you know, of course, you've got what you need in order to run it and to pay the employees. But then it, in, in addition to that, we can say this much, 80% or whatever the profits, or we can even say the 100% of the profits once we've taken care of the business side of it, that goes towards the domestic violence shelter. And then repeat. Right? Then you do it as it relates to, to other things. Then you've got, mashallah, you guys have a portion of it already. Like this 10-year program, mentorship program that you guys have been doing here in this masjid with the young girls, mashallah. Like that is, that's huge. Right? That's one of the things that also does it. But then you say, okay, there are a group of, there are some of them who are going to be, who have the aptitude to be hufad. Right? There's some of them, mashallah, who can who can study some fiqh and we can like really train them. So it's like, then we start training them because the truth is, and they can be small. Do you guys, you got Rama foundation. So you just have a, have a, a an elm arm of it. Right. Yeah. And they're just, their whole thing is like their, their job is to make sure that you, they study this Dean and they have, but they have an assignment. Right. So I heard that there are women who actually work together here in the Bay but they're a part of different massages. So now that one of those young women who've just finished, right? Now her job is she's stationed at this masjid and she's going to run this young women's halakha, whatever, 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 for however long. And this one is not going to run this woman's halakha for however long. Eventually, you have a women's movement. Especially if every year you come together, let's say for a, a women's retreat, a women's conference. But, and those are the women who are running and they're teaching it. You have a, that's going to spread. Pretty much that's what they did to us in Tareem. <laughs> like in the end, we're majority, at least the ones who were in America. Then you got like Makassid, you got, uh, what is it, Greensville Trust in the UK. They all end up going somewhere and establishing something. Uh, resources, educational resources to learn more about the Islam. Oh, no, no, Asma. Oh. There's a book there, you know, it's so sad. The first woman that um, is known in the, in the known, the more modern world to write um, a story about her was Jean, uh, what's her name? Jean-Claude something. Jean, oh, called the, it's called the, the Cali, the Khalifa's daughter. The Khalifa's daughter. Jean Boyd. Jean Boyd wrote a book called the Khalifa's daughter. Gives her whole life story, mashallah. Well, Rabata did uh they have like a feature on there about her, mm -hmm. like a article about her. But if you look her up now she is some it's amazing that now she's becoming more and more and more known. Um but her project was a very sim the project that we have in the Gambia is called the Yantaru project. So Yantaru means meant the blessed collective. And it was a the collective of women. And so it's actually the Yan the Yantaru uh organization that actually is what you know the, so the collective also has a double meaning also means the sisterhood and so it's these women that you know would go and and do these villages very similar to yeah even subhanallah if we with the organization right like we're talking about from the economic arm if you start a business whether it's an online business rahma foundation i'm just saying rahma foundation decided they're going to sell hijabs online <laughs> 
right? So the proceeds from those hijabs that are being sold online will then actually go, meaning she, the masjid doesn't have to give money for that sister to go teach, right? The sisters who are part of that collective, they pay money for her to go teach, right? And could be somewhere else. Oh, wow, well, I need, to, yes. It can go to Chicago. Like, okay, we're going to send you, you know, hopefully she'll get married to my name, John, Chicago. But, but, but it can be, right? <laughs> the thing is, is that we, you know, subhanAllah, you, we, you guys are paying all kinds of, you're paying the imams, you're paying. But if you want a women's, if you want women to succeed and to be able to have access, right, for daughters all over, because the truth is we need it at this point. We need it. We're, you know, the, um, like I, even the emotional and gender intelligence. I'm like, you have it. Yes, somebody had a question. Yeah, the, the Caliph's sister. Thank you. So, Shehu Uthman Demphodio, that's very important. When Shehu Uthman Demphodio, Rahmatullah, when he passed away, uh, Muhammad Bello became the Khalifa. Her brother became the Khalifa. And so there was kind of like this, you know, big thing. And she, you know, basically when he came to power, then she was like, okay. You run that. Uh, uh, politics, uh, I got to make sure that we have, that the women are taken care of. So this one is a tough one. Let me say this. When it comes to you studying, oh, uh, when it comes to studying, if your husband is not in alignment with you studying, the first thing is that you don't have a choice in that matter because it's a matter of your father and I. So it's your responsibility, it's your duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go to study. Now, we do have to make it easy for each other, meaning if your husband is like, I know you can't go to Tareem and go study, <laughs> right? I mean, that's not, that's a, in that case, that's, that's consistent with his right. Like I, you know, for my wife to go study somewhere in Tareem, why? Because I'm going to be away from you and I'm here and come. That's, that's challenging. No, subhanAllah. But he can't say, okay, you want to go online and study with, you know, the Rabata or you've got a sister's Hanukkah or there's something, you know, there has to be some, uh, it can't be just like, you know what, if you you don't want to go with me to Syria to study that's it no come on now um that but however if it's there are more resources that are accessible and available now when it comes to if you're not able to study like for example if there's you know aqida is not being taught in your region and you need to go to minnesota <laughs> Right? You need to go to Minnesota to take this class, you know, for a few months because it's not being taught. Okay, that's a few months. You can do that. You can go. And I know that I'm giving, you know, for the most part, people are like, come on, but you did it. You know, you come on. You went You went and studied in Egypt. You went and studied in Tadim. And there are a couple of things about that. Number one, yes, I did that. But number, I'm also, I'm the only Muslim in my family. Right? And I'm the youngest of eight girls. So there was there I, there was no mahram you know that could take me. Let me say that there was no brother, there was no uncle, um, you know that was going to take me overseas. And at the time when I began studying, I was married, so I did have permission <laughs> to go and study. So that's a different, that's a very different case that I had permission to go study. So Allah yirhamu. Any other questions? Uh, but let me also say this. Um, there needs to be a lot of dua in, in Qiyamul Layl, in Sujood, regarding the marriages of our community. Pray for each other and each other's marriages because that's something if you make dua for your sister, it's, it's you know, a dua mustajab, it's accepted. It's also something that is a very, it's, it's a very difficult situation to be in where you feel like I want to study, I want to be more committed to my deen, but I don't have someone who is supportive of that. And that's usually based upon either one or two things, either because that person is concerned and we have to, we also have to take on this concern. Either that person is concerned that, okay, you're going to become knowledgeable and expose what I expose me for what I don't know. So there's an insecurity in your spouse. Um, that's one aspect. The other thing is, is that there may be a fear that, um, and this happens, I've seen this happen, you know, right? We have to tell the truth about this. I've seen women like, oh, get knowledgeable. And then, you know, you're going home like, 
Well, you don't know that. And you don't know your father than I. Well, if you studied your Aqidah, brother, well, you know, like we, we get a little sassy, right? And so it's important that as we study and as we're, you cannot be studying, I'm going to be honest, whatever you're studying, that's, you know, to sawaf and taskiyah has, has to be a part of that. Like akhlaq has to be a part of that. Um, because if, if, if ilm made you arrogant, then you missed the point. Right. And so, and if, especially if that brother is financially supporting you, I don't know the case, right? I don't know the situation. I'm giving generalizations. But if that person was financially supporting you and is because of that, you know, that's where you, that's how you eat. That's how you, you know, get your livelihood. Then, you know, be, be gentle and careful about how you just disregard or, you know, the sub of the means by which you may be able to study. Or that's also, you know, because the, the, the haq of nikah is with the woman. Right? Allah is just, but the haq of talaq is with the man. So you chose that man. That was your, you know what I mean? You you made that decision. So, yeah, work that out the best you can. <laughs> <laughs> you got to pray on that, suffer with that. You know, most people think I'm no suburb with that as until until Allah shows you there's a beautiful ayah in Surah Al Talaq that I just found it so beautiful. Inshallah, my sister's gonna recite it for me. Where is she? No, she stopped out, but I'm gonna recite, tell you in English. And like Allah talks about the patience, and when you have patience, right? Have patience until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a way out. I remember when I, I find it amazing. Surah Tawbah. Surah Tawbah. Surah Tawbah. Sorry. Surah Tawbah. And it's about that if you're patient, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you a way out. And don't think that that means exactly. Don't think that that means like, oh, I'm about to have, don't think that means of divorce. No. Inshallah, that means Allah will open up his heart. Allah will soften his heart. That Allah will increase him in knowledge and understanding by which that, you know, you studying, you being more religious, me, you being more committed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is easier on you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easier on you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of our sisters that are having, that are struggling in their marriage, especially that are, that are struggling in ways by which they want to be more committed to Allah. May Allah, Ya Rabbi, bless their husbands to be more understanding, more compassionate, and increase them in knowledge and wisdom. Allahumma salli wa sallam. Make dua for your husband. Please don't just, you know, we have enough divorces. Make dua for him. May Allah give him hidayah.